let's play a game. This is my room now, and this is my room from my video a couple weeks ago. See if you can spot the differences. Did you see it? That lotion bottle that was in the corner of the room? Yeah, I decided to move that since, you know, it's summertime and my hands don't get so chapped anymore. Also, if you're paying really close attention, you might have noticed that it's a completely different zip code. Now, there's two possible explanations for this. One is that I just moved. Two is that I made a video months ago and just let it sit around on my computer because of crippling anxiety. The downside of this new room, though, is that the acoustics, like this piece of paper, they're terrible. <laughs> Whenever I'm treating a room, I find it useful to think of sound waves like a ping pong ball. You know, it'll bounce off hard surfaces, it'll bounce off hard surfaces, it'll bounce off hard surfaces, soft surfaces, not so much. The corners of the room are going to bounce really unpredictably, so you better put something soft up there. And any parallel walls is going to bounce back and forth over and over forever, so you better put something soft there. That pretty much does it. Now there's one major problem with this way of thinking, and that's that this isn't a sound wave. It's a ping pong ball. Also, this isn't a sound wave. It's a graph of a sound wave. Let me explain. Let's get rid of this. So I just want to back up to the video I did a couple weeks ago about music being made on a dice roll. I made a little mistake on it. It's not that big of a deal. It's really just a thing of lingo. And I just wanted to address it before some crazy music nerd chews me out for it. So at one point in the video, I did this. After that, I just repeated the pattern again, but with the respect of seven chords. Hold on, I forgot the little circle on seven. My intention was the first 14 rolls on the 20-sided dice to all be found naturally in the key of C. Now, however, a 7 diminished 7 chord is not found naturally in the key. A 7 half diminished 7 chord is. A diminished 7 chord is four notes stacked on top of each other, each a minor third apart. In the case of a 7 diminished 7 chord in the key of C, that would be B, D, F, and A flat. A flat, however, is not found in the key of C, so you'd have to raise it up a half step to an A, making it a 7 half diminished 7. If you go back and watch my fingers as I'm playing the song, I did play a 7 half diminished 7 chord. I just called it a 7 diminished 7 chord because it was my first ever YouTube video and I had no idea what I'm doing. Not much unlike now. Anyway, with all that crap out of the way, let's get to the rest of the video. I should have worn different pants. Just to help you get an idea of how bad the acoustics are in this room, I set up my most sensitive condenser mic. It's a Shure SM81 uh, without the bass roll off turned on, for those of you who are interested. By the way, I recommend wearing headphones during this part so you can get a full idea of how bad it is. Before we can fix the problem, we have to understand what the problem actually is. And to do that, we have to answer the question, what is music? Music is sound. Sound is vibrations. Okay, as much as I like that gag, that's not a good definition. I mean, it is a good definition, but chances are, if you're anything like me, you didn't understand it at first. If you're anything like me, what you heard was, sound is a form of vibration. That's not what I said. I said sound is vibration. All sound is is a construct of your mind, a way your brain interprets the vibrations that your ears have picked up. Even Britannica defines sound as that which is perceived by the ear, and then immediately tells you why that's a bad definition, and we'll get to that. Vibration is energy in the form of waves. And finally, we're asking the right questions. What is a wave? There are two types of waves in this world, transverse and longitudinal. 
Transverse waves are pretty easy. It's waves that pretty much just go up and down. That's everything from light waves that help you see, to microwaves that help you cook your food, to even ocean waves. That's not sound waves though. Sound waves are what's called longitudinal waves, and longitudinal waves work a little bit differently. Take for example the space between my hands. Now there's going to be air molecules between my hands, and they should be for the most part evenly spaced. Whenever a sound wave, let's say, propagates here and travels this way towards this hand, what's going to happen is the air molecules near where the sound wave begins are going to compress really tightly, and that compression is going to move through the space to the other hand. When there's a compression of molecules, the air gets really dense in a certain area, and those extra molecules don't just come from nowhere, they have to come from the surrounding areas. So as a result of a compression being made, there's an expansion right beside it, also known as a rarefaction if you want to sound like a pretentious dude. Whenever you hear a sound, what's really happening is there is a compression of molecules followed by a rarefaction of molecules, followed by usually another compression, then another rarefaction, on and on and on, very, very quickly. Okay, so now imagine you could push the pause button on a sound wave. You would have a compression followed by a rarefaction. Now from the beginning of that compression to the end of that rarefaction is known as one wavelength. And it's usually represented in math by the letter Y that's had a little bit too much to Now if you were to press play on that sound wave, that compression and the rarefaction would move across the room at the speed of sound. And the time it takes for those to pass a specific point is known as a period, usually represented by the letter T. Now finally think of a second. The amount of periods that happen within that second determine the pitch of a note. For instance, in the note A, there's 440 periods per second. That's known as the frequency. So what does all this have to do with treating my room? Honestly, not that much. I just started nerding out and didn't know when to stop. Sorry guys. But let's, let's get into it. What are you doing when you're treating your room? Well, keep in mind, there's compressions and then rarefactions whenever a sound wave propagates through a room. Well, there's really not much resistance that comes when air molecules are moving. They're air molecules. You can move them out of the way doing anything. Molecules in, say, drywall are a little different. When the sound wave hits that drywall, the energy's gotta go somewhere, but the drywall's too densely packed, or the metal, or the wood, or whatever you're hitting is too densely packed to really send a good sound wave through. A little bit will go through, but not all of it. The rest of it is a ping pong ball. It bounces back. This is a process known as reflection. How do you combat that? Well, let me introduce you to my friend, Oralex. This stuff makes a world of difference against reflections. My explanation in the beginning of this video didn't quite do it justice. I said the ping pong ball won't bounce off the soft surface, and that's for the most part true, but there's actually a little bit more to it when it comes to sound waves. Now remember what I said about compressions, rarefactions, I know it's getting old. Compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, compression, 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 and that hits something that doesn't really have the room to compress the rare fact. Compression, rarefaction. It bounces off. So what you need is a material that has room to compress and rare fact. Compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction. So there's two types of foam. Open celled and closed celled. Now I'll, I'll give you just a minute to think through it and see if you can figure out which one works better for acoustics. The answer is open celled. Let me know in the comments if you got it right. Now if you look really closely at this acoustic foam, you may notice absolutely nothing. I was trying to show you the little holes permeating through the foam, but all you can tell on the camera is that they're just black dots. And the fact that it has little black dots doesn't make my point about how porous is he. So let's talk foam. So on the left here we have open cell foam. Notice the open cells that's good for trapping in air or water. It's good for acoustic foam, cleaning sponges, or protective packaging. And on the right we have closed cell foam. Notice the closed cells. Because it's so much more dense, it's really good for keeping out air or moisture, so insulating and sealing joints. As I already mentioned, the more porous open cell foam is what we're more interested in today because air can pass through it. And if air can pass through it, so can a sound wave. 
the compressions and refractions moving through the foam cause it to also compress and refract. This results in a considerable transfer of energy, which causes the sound wave to deplete in the foam. Now, if you haven't put it together yet, this is the same sort of physics that goes into being able to cook a chicken by slapping it. But that's, um, honestly a perfect way to explain this. Hold up, I'll be right back. Okay, so I have some chicken. Take this frozen piece of chicken. Now, theoretically speaking, I could slap the chicken and it would cook it. Now, obviously this is still ice cold because I didn't slap it hard enough or fast enough. Now, here's a video of somebody who did rig up a machine to slap a chicken enough times to be able to actually cook it. See, what's happening here is as I slap the chicken, the shock wave of my hand is propagating through the chicken, causing the molecules to compress, and then the ones behind it to refract, and then that compression moves through the chicken. Action. Compression, refraction, compression, refraction, compression. Sound waves. As those molecules compress and refract, compression, refraction, they're rubbing up against each other and creating friction. Now that friction does two things. One, it creates just a tiny little amount of heat. And that heat is what's eventually gonna cook the chicken if I just keep slapping the chicken. The other thing that happens is that energy in the form of heat is dissipating. So, the sound is actually dampening as it moves through the chicken. The same is true for acoustic foam. As a sound wave travels through the acoustic foam, the molecules in it will rub up against each other and create friction and turn the sound energy into heat energy. And that is how acoustic foam works. And no, your guitar tone's not gonna be so gnarly that your acoustic foam catches on fire. Now there's two things you want to keep into consideration whenever you're setting up your acoustic foam. Number one is absorption, and number two is diffusion. See what happens is when sound hits a wall, it becomes a ping pong ball and bounces back. And when it bounces back and hits your mic, your mic will catch the same sound a second time, but this time just a little bit weaker. That'll create an echo or reverb, depending on how long it takes the sound wave to come back. Sometimes sound waves will bounce off a wall, hit your mic, bounce off another wall, hit your mic, bounce off the first wall again, hit your mic, you, you get the point. Each time the signal gets just a little bit weaker and it'll create a long reverb, the tail you were probably hearing at the beginning of this video. Here's the thing, it's really tempting to think that any sound wave other than the original source hitting your mic is bad and that's not necessarily true. See, when you get to the fourth or fifth bounce or reflection, the sound will actually have a nice pleasing ring to it, at least in the higher frequencies. And a lot of times if you can, if you can get away with it, having a room that's well acoustically treated will have several reflections back to the mic, but the reflections won't hit the mic until they've bounced off three or four walls and they've diminished to a point that's pleasing to the ear. That's called diffusion. Since we're talking about acoustic foam, we need to talk about absorption. Now absorption is that process we just got done talking about. It's where the molecules compress and rare fat inside of the acoustic foam and that allows friction to diminish the sound. So if you imagine you're setting your mic, say, right here, where my mic is set up you're going to want acoustic foam to be on all parallel sides of that. So I have a wall right here, I have a wall right here. I'm going to want to put acoustic foam up on that wall so that the sound absorbs into the, the, the foam and doesn't bounce back and forth across. I'm not going to worry too much about it going at an angle because at an angle the sound's going to bounce off a wall, hit another wall, hit the ceiling and the floor and do all this other wild ninja stuff and it's eventually going to come back to the mic as a fairly pleasing reverberation. So when you're treating your room you really want to pay close attention to 
where the mic is going to sit in your room. The other thing is if you're having a home studio, like this is, you're going to want to treat the room for the specific place you were sitting. The sound when you're mixing is going to come out of your speakers and hit the wall behind you and bounce back, as well as come out of your speakers, hit the wall beside you and bounce back into your ears, creating an echo and you're going to make decisions in your mix that's based off what your room sounds like. And then when you take the song out of your room, say the car test, it's going to sound like dirty garbage. So with all that finally out of the way, let's put some FOMO. Compression, perfection, compression, perfection, compression, perfection, compression, perfection, compression, perfection, compression, perfection, compression. So now that my room is all treated, I set up my SM81 so I could get a before and after um, of how the room sounds. So let's see if, if just this little bit of foam I put on the sides and on the front and back walls here actually made a difference. Even just sitting here talking, I can tell that the room just sounds better. It just sounds better. The clap test was just a complete 180. I thought there was a significant improvement in the guitar and also the horn, except for... Now there was an improvement, the tail on the, the after is just a little bit shorter, but the bass frequencies just seem to be bouncing back so much more, and there's a reason for that. And we're going to get to that in the next video. Just as a quick disclaimer, because I know you guys can't gripe at me as much as I can gripe about myself, I know the mic was in a little bit of a different place for like a real true scientific test to prove before and after. Uh, the mic would have had to have been exactly where it was before, and it wasn't. I actually purposely put it a little bit further forward, so it's between my acoustic panels that are on the sides, which is probably more realistically where we're going to be setting up my mic when I'm recording. Um, I'm also probably going to get some more acoustic foam down the line. If you'll notice, this whole wall right here is kind of bare, which again, as I mentioned before, that's not going to be a problem at all if I'm recording right here. If my guitar's here, my mic's here, or something like that, <clears throat> that's not going to be a problem, but for a million different reasons, I may want to put my mic further back in the room, and before I do that, I'm going to need uh, some more acoustic foam on that wall. Right now, I am more than pleased with, with how this treating turned out. 
See, my room is almost done, but we still need to talk about bass frequencies, and we still need to talk about standing waves, and uh, those are both very long-winded discussions, and this video is already getting kind of long. So we're going to have to get together in the next video, and we're going to have to talk about those. But already, just with this much, even if, if you can just do this much, it is a world of difference, and it's going to make your recording sound so much better. It's going to make even just, just sitting in your room and playing just feel better. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Compression, perfection. Compression, perfection. Compression, perfection. Compression, perfection.